the Bar Association of Civil Rights and Social Justice Leadership Council. I'm the co-chair of the ABA's African American Affairs Committee and vice chair of the National Bar Association Civil Rights Law Section. I'm also a member of the National Medical Association's Minority Affairs and Minority Health Section. Prior to uh, the work that I do now, uh, prior to retiring from the National Education Association, I served in multiple leadership capacities, including as the executive director of a large multi-special ambulatory facility devoted to equity and minority health care, including those in the correction system who, if in fact they were hurt, um, maybe uh, had mental health issues or what have you, in the Los Angeles County health system or correction system, they came to the facility that I had responsibility for. And much earlier in my career, I was an officer of the court in the area of child protective services, and I was a parole and probation officer providing supervision for court-appointed juvenile and adult facilities identified as those being in need of intensive supervision. And these works helped shape my perspectives on social justice, human and civil rights, and sharpen my commitment to the protection of civil liberties. And that's why the work that I do now uh, with the ABA and the NBA is so very really important to me. I'm going to first introduce you to someone who really needs no introduction, I am sure, and that is Congressman Bobby Scott. Uh, Congressman Scott has done a great deal of work with us at the National Bar Association. He is always on call for us there, and he was equally so when I called upon him to uh, come and present to us here on these very important issues as we start to uh, talk about uh, the injustice of the justice system, disproportionate, and mass incarceration of African Americans. Congressman Scott is very immersed in that work. Congressman Scott represents Virginia's third congressional district in the U.S. House of Representatives, and he has done so since 1993. Prior to his service in Congress, he served in the Virginia House of Delegates from 1978 to 1983, and in the Senate of Virginia from 1983 to 1993. During his tenure in the Virginia General Assembly, Congressman Scott successfully sponsored laws critical to Virginians in education, employment, health care, social services, economic development, crime prevention, and consumer protection. Congressman Scott, thankfully for us, currently serves as the chairman of the Committee on Education and Labor. In this capacity, he is advancing an agenda that improves equity in education, frees students from burdens of crippling debt, protects and expands access to affordable health care, ensures workers have a safe workplace where they can earn a living wage free from discrimination and guarantee seniors have a secure and dignified retirement. I am not going to go through this extensive background that Congressman Scott has, but I do want you to know that he has worked on legislation to reform and update our nation's career and technical education system as well as the juvenile justice system which were both signed into law by President Donald Trump. The latter legislation is <laughs> everybody exhale. <laughs> the latter legislation, the Juvenile Justice Reform Act, contained core tenets of Congressman Scott's youth prison reduction through opportunities, mentoring, intervention support, and education use promise. The congressman has served as a ranking member of the Subcommittee on Crime, Terrorism, and Homeland Security on the Committee on the Judiciary. Congressman Scott is also lead, a leading advocate for reforming our nation's broken criminal justice system. Congressman Scott sponsored the Death and Custody Reporting Act, which was originally signed into law by President Bill Clinton in 2000 and its subsequent reauthorization was signed into law by President Barack Obama in 2014. I think the Congressman Scott will be able to give you far more information on his work in this area around criminal justice, criminal justice reform, and the work that we need to do as we start to talk about mass incarceration. So I give you Congressman Scott. Thank you. 
interested in your very uh, generous um, introduction. I noticed that uh, there was one person in the audience uh, listening. I don't know about <laughs> everybody else. But it is a pleasure to, uh, to be here with the, the other panelists to talk about um, disproportionate mass incarceration amongst African Americans. We had a very exciting uh, panel that uh, just ended, and I want to congratulate all of the panelists that brought uh, excellent information. The um, problem that we're addressing, disproportionate mass incarceration, is just a matter of arithmetic. We know from a few research that um, about any, any incarceration rate over about 350 per 100,000, you start getting diminishing returns for locking people up. The crime reduction value of uh, increasing the crime rate, uh, the incarceration rate, much more than that, is really diminishing. When you get close to 500 per 100,000 and keep going, it's actually counterproductive. You're getting virtually no criminal justice um, uh, benefit from it. In fact, you're adding to it because you've got too many people with felony records, can't find jobs. Uh, you've got too many children being raised by parents in prison. Uh, you've got using so much of the Justice Department budget on uh, jails and prisons that aren't doing anything uh, when that money could have been spent on evidence-based approach to do something about crime. Uh, so with that background, we look at our incarceration rate, 700 per 100,000 way over into the counterproductive range. And since we're talking about disproportionate African Americans are locked up at the rate of 2,200 per 100,000. Most countries lock up about 100 to 150, maybe 200 per 100,000. United States, 700. Blacks, 2,200. 10 states lock up blacks at the rate of about 4,000 per 100,000, 40 times the uh, international average. So the Problem is just a matter of uh, arithmetic, and then you wonder how you got there. We got there by making bad choices. Criminal justice, re criminal justice, you have a choice in policy. You can reduce crime and save money using evidence and research to guide your deliberations, or you can codify a bunch of simple-minded slogans and sound bites that do nothing to reduce crime but just load up the prisons. Unfortunately, uh, we've been doing the slogans and sound bites since the Nixon started it with the war on drugs and went through, um, I think we heard in the last panel that uh, one uh, member was apologizing for his vote on the Clinton crime bill in uh, 1994. Uh, that thing was so full of slogans and sound bites and foolishness that Bill Clinton didn't even defend the Clinton crime bill um, at this point. Um, it had about every kind of cold tested slogan that you can imagine was in that bill. It helped um, the racial disparity, it helped enhance the racial disparities, it helped load up the prisons, and did virtually nothing uh, to reduce crime. And so that's where we uh, uh, find ourselves, and the advantage in criminal justice reform is that um, everything you do will actually reduce crime and save money. There are a number of states that have figured that they just can't spend, they just can't afford the foolishness anymore. Uh, Texas, for example, uh, was told a couple of years ago that they needed to come up with two billion dollars, one state, two billion dollars, to imprison expansion to keep up with the growing prison population. And somebody said, "Ooh, maybe we spend about 10 percent of that on prevention, early intervention, and rehabilitation." evidence-based approach to try to reduce crime, maybe we won't have to spend all two billion. And so they tried it. They spent about 200 million intelligently and then looked up and they noticed that they didn't need to build any new prisons. In fact, they were able to close some they had. Now this creates some interesting uh, coalition because you get a lot of people who like the idea that you just saved two billion dollars and a lot of other people think we have a more humane criminal justice system and can't we all get along? That seems like a good, a good, good path to take. Previous to that, the uh, approach in, 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 in crime, you had to be tough on crime. You had to support all the foolishness, otherwise people would say you were soft on crime and you would lose your election. Well, a lot of people never studied the issues and never wanted to be charged with being soft on crime, and so everybody just followed the slogans and sound bites. And nobody was responsible 
for the mass incarceration. Uh, the police are just doing their jobs uh, or following the law. The judges just apply the mandatory minimums and other, uh, other enhanced penalties. They're just doing their jobs. The prisons take what's coming to them. The legislators uh, do what they do. They do what helps them get elected. So nobody was at fault. It's just you had a messed up criminal justice system. And um, one thing happened uh, about three or four years ago. Uh, Jim Simpson Brenner from Wisconsin and I, the chair and the ranking member of the Crime Subcommittee, decided to hold a series of hearings about what we can do about the criminal justice system. We had about 10 or 15 uh, hearings, and at the end of it, wrote a report about what we can do to reduce crime and save money. And we put together the Safe Justice Act, which had a lot of provisions, uh, uh, prevention, uh, money investments in prevention, prevention uh, investments in police training, after you finish the debate about whose fault it is, about what police are doing, the answer is going to be police training. If you didn't have any money for police training, then that all debate was a waste of time. We just jump ahead and put money in there for police training. Uh, problem solving courts like drug courts, mental health courts, uh, so that people, you can deal with the problem rather than the revolving door. We got rid of, firstly, all of the mandatory minimums in drug cases uh, because they were just, they were just silly. I mean, you, you, Girlfriends getting decades, uh, getting more time uh, for just being a girlfriend, take a message, maybe drive the guy to, the, to a drug deal, okay, you're part of the conspiracy. You're, get, you're, you're, you're sentenced based on the weight of the drugs. Drug looks up, okay, you're guilty, let me see. You, your boyfriend was dealing a ton of crack, you're part of the co conspiracy. You get charged like you're dealing a ton of crack and you get all these girlfriends sitting up in prison 10, 20, 25 years. Absolutely ridiculous. We got rid of all, all of those. When you get to prison, a money for rehabilitation, and when you get out, a second chance programs, a start to finish a change in direction, all based on evidence and research. Now, one trick in, 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 in this is if you start off with the idea that you're going to follow evidence and research, then there will be very little debate about what's going on. You come up with an idea. If it makes sense, supported by evidence and research, it can, it can go forward. Uh, if not, you don't go forward. That's where all the mandatory minimums go, right down the drain, because there's no evidence to support them. It turned out, where everybody was kind of scared to get on something that eliminated mandatory minimums, we received tremendous support. Wide range of people, people trying to save money, people trying to improve the justice system, all started jumping on board. And it was electric to the point where um, Senator Grassley, chair of the Judiciary Committee in the Senate, announced that he had to do something because they were going to get rid of all the mandatory minimums that he liked. And so he came up with an alternative bill that derailed the Safe Justice Act. But it did establish the idea that you could support such a bill and get tremendous support. And it just kind of changed the idea about criminal justice reform uh, ever since. Uh, we, had, we were able to pass the First Step Act, which was a small step, I believe, in the right direction. Uh, they did not have sufficient hearings. They didn't get a CBO score, and the process was all messed up because it was basically, it was basically politicians cutting a deal uh, in the back room. And I think the deal was more good than bad, so it, uh, it passed. But we need to get to, to back to the point where we can have hearings, get evidence, research, and support things that are supported by evidence and research to reduce crime and save money. Once we, the, uh, one of the things the Safe Justice Act did was allow the Attorney General to reprogram money for prisons, because you get rid of the mandatory minimums, you're going to save a lot of money, and you'd have money for the prevention and all the other things that. Uh, the prison, prison uh, support, second chance, you had plenty of money to spend on all the other, uh, other activities. Uh, so if we can get to the point where we first agree that we reduce evidence and research, we can reduce crime and save money, and then get on to other uh, issues like solitary confinement, um, uh, police training, we, the implicit bias, the de-escalation, profiling, 
a bail reform, which ought to be uh, not uh, wealth-based, but risk-based. Uh, Court-appointed attorneys, uh, public radio had a piece uh, just a couple of days ago where if you're charged with a crime and are found guilty, if you've got a court-appointed lawyer, they attach that as cost of court, but not the fact that you're found guilty, you've got to pay for the lawyer. In Virginia, if you're found not guilty, you don't have to pay anything, but apparently in some states it's a, it's a different idea. Uh, so there are a lot of things, um, and we're going to hear about the um, criminalization of poverty, how just being poor gets you into a lot of, um, um, a lot of problems. Uh, but the, the bottom line is if we can insist that, that uh, legislators provide to follow evidence and research, we can, make, we can cover a lot of ground, improving the criminal justice system, uh, removing the disproportionate uh, and mass, incarceration, mass incarceration by insisting that they just, let me finish with this, just four, just in, anytime you come up with an idea, evaluate it on four points. One, what does it do for mass incarceration? Does it just load up the prisons? Does it do anything on that? Second, what is the racial impact? We'll find a lot of stuff as a known, predictable racial disparity. Uh, third, how are you fighting the uh, drug abuse? Are you fighting it like a public health uh, issue or war on drugs that it was a colossal failure? And fourth, are you using evidence and research to support your initiative or is it just uh, slogans and sound bites? And that will be apparent just looking at, looking at, the, um, at the bill. Uh, with that, I look forward to the uh, discussion and thank you for the opportunity to be here. Karen is the Executive Director of the Job Opportunities Task Force, an independent statewide nonprofit organization that promotes policies and programs to help low wage workers advance to high wage jobs. She is the first African American female to lead this 22 year old organization. Karen works tirelessly to encourage key policymakers and stakeholders to adopt and support policies and programs that eliminate educational and employment barriers to facilitate the successful entry or re-entry of low-income adult workers and job seekers into the workforce. She has been instrumental in leading numerous state and local policy reform efforts that focus on individuals with a criminal background, including, but not limited to, ban the box laws, expansion of criminal record expungement, and shielding laws, the development, passage, and implementation of the American Justice of the Maryland Justice Reinvestment Act and statewide bail reform. Carolyn, Karen majored in international studies at Washington College and has worked within state and local politics for over 10 years. And Karen is passionate about the criminalization of poverty. <laughs> joining us on this Friday afternoon. I know we are probably, I know there's another session afterwards where we're probably standing in between you and whatever happy hour or dinner or fun that you guys are involved in. So I'm so excited to be Debbie Downer for a minute and then bring you guys right back up on criminalization poverty. <laughs> so, um, as Ms. Swan indicated, um, I'm the executive director of a nonprofit that focuses on workforce. We live and breathe how to ensure that low wage workers advance to high wage jobs, not just any job, but a job that will set you on a pathway to economic mobility and stability. And so I, before I really get into criminalization of poverty, I think it's important to explain why an entity like JOTF, Job Opportunities Task Force, is even in this work, right? We, we don't have a bench of lawyers on staff. We're not like the ACLU. We, again, live and breathe workforce development. But we're a statewide organization and we're based in Baltimore City. And so if our mission is to help low wage workers advance to high wage jobs in Baltimore City, the majority of our communities are over policed and underserved, we were finding that there was a significant segment of the working population that was effectively unemployable as a result of a criminal record. This was key in Maryland because in Maryland we have this online database called the Maryland Judiciary Case Search. Case Search allows you to access anyone's criminal background information with the touch of a key. All you need is internet access. That's not the case in other states. You need some type of special authorization. You have to pay some fee if you want to access this very sensitive information. 
Unfortunately, in Maryland, all you need is internet access, a laptop or a tablet. Welcome, State's Attorney Ray Floyd. And so, for a very, very long time, JOTF, and when State's Attorney Brave Boyd was then Delegate uh, Brave Boyd in the Maryland General Assembly, we worked on policy initiatives and efforts that sought to reduce the impact of the criminal record as it result, as it related to employment. That was our focus. How do we address the impact of the criminal record, given that the record that was once used for sentencing and charging decisions was now the sole determinant in hiring decisions, housing decisions, all of these many decisions that's impacting someone's ability to be successful. And so we focused on the impact of the record. That started around 2011. So we focused on ban the box on job applications at both the local and the state level. We focused on criminal record expungement. And we focused on occupational licensing reform. You need an occupational license many times to get many jobs. But in many states, particularly in Maryland, that criminal conviction, or it doesn't even have to be a conviction, is going to jeopardize your ability to access economic livelihood in a particular industry. In 2014, we moved from just the focus on the criminal record to the impact of incarceration on families. So we focused on justice reinvestment. The following year is when we had the April uprising. It was the death of Freddie Gray, and the city went to the streets, and we saw that there was communal anger around this focus on over-incarceration and lack of investment in our communities. The following year, in April 2016, the United States Department of Justice released a report where they investigated the policies and practices of the Baltimore Police Department and pretty much found that the majority of their practices were discriminatory, unconstitutional, um, in any way, shape, or form when it comes to residents of color. And so JOTF, immediately after that report, it became clear to us that what we are doing is we are effectively criminalizing our poor, right? After the uprising and the Rite Aids and the CBS and the fire and the national media left Baltimore City, then it was like everyone realized, oh, these communities have been like this for the past 20, 30 years. It didn't have to just deal with the death of a young black guy. This is the result. Crime is fueled by lack of economic instability and opportunity. Oh, maybe we should do something about this. And so JOTF then went on a two-year investigation to look at how our laws and policies were effectively criminalizing and penalizing our poor. And as a result, we came up with 104 pages that detail how we're doing just that. And we broke it down into three parts. Common pathways by which you enter the system. Once you're in the, into the system, the criminal justice disparate, disparate uh, impact on the poor, and then the collateral consequences of the criminal record. And so I'm just going to quickly walk you uh, through the report um, and then come up with some and advise you of some recommendations that you all can act on both at the courthouse level but also at the state house level because they are very, very well intertwined and connected. First part, common pathways by which individuals are entering into the criminal justice system. We all know racial profiling is the, is the most common pathway and the prior panel um, spoke very eloquently um, about that pathway. Child support is a way that individuals are easily entering into the criminal justice system. I'm going to give you an example. We're a statewide organization. We run a pre-apprenticeship construction training program. We are taking individuals with serious criminal records and training them in the trades and then setting them on a pathway towards apprenticeship and stable employment. Okay, I say serious criminal record because if you have drugs, we're like, yes, you're in. That's easy to us. We take folks who have even sex offenses, attempted murder, because a lot of workforce development programs will not take them. Okay? So we have an individual that graduated, actually a Prince George's County resident, Anthony. Anthony owes $27,000 in state owed arrears and child support. Driver's license is suspended. In Maryland, they suspend your driver's license if you don't pay within 60 days. Anthony can't get a job. And in a couple of months, if he doesn't pay, there's the threat of incarceration. So the mom, the custodial parent, knowing that Anthony needs to work and contribute to the family and be involved with his family, wrote a letter to the court saying, please forgive these arrears. There's no way he's going to be able to pay it. And we need him to be reacclimated with the family. The next day, the courts unfortunately declined the request. The notarized letter from the mom asking for them to be forgiven said, it's too much money. We need that. So we're not going to honor your request. And so now Anthony has to deal with the driver's license suspension as a result of his inability to pay something he could never pay in the first place. And that is effectively jeopardizing his ability to get work that will allow him to pay these arrears that he is being forced to pay. And then if he doesn't pay it, he's going to jail, which is going to further complicate his ability to pay these arrears. Child support, okay? Motor vehicle laws, again, right? Auto insurance. By law in the state of Maryland, if you drive without insurance, it's an incarcerable offense. 
But if I live in a certain community and insurance companies can use non-driving factors to set my rates, zip code, education, income, credit, that means that black communities are paying more, white communities are not. And so if you have a black worker who's paying $400 in liability alone per month, that's a real story, you're going to prioritize what's important. Car insurance ain't going to be it that month. And so now you're driving in a community in Baltimore City that's over police and underserved. You're getting stopped for driving without insurance. And now you're in jail. How is that actually going to help you to pay that insurance that you couldn't pay in the first place because you were either unemployed or underemployed? And so your inability to pay is literally leading you into the criminal justice system. Civil asset forfeiture. I don't have to go into detail about the impact and how medieval civil asset forfeiture is and the impact that it's having on families. Once individuals are arrested and they're in the system, they are ensnarled based on the fines and the fees that disallow them from getting out. The cash bail system. You're arrested, you're charged, you're not sentenced or convicted. But if you are not released on your own recognizance, or if there are, if you're not released on an unsecured man, you are, you know, given a cash bail or you're detained. But if you cannot make that cash bail, you have to be sent. And we're not talking about thousand dollars, we're talking about individuals who can't make $250 in bail or less. And they then have to sit to their trial in order to then go home. Just imagine the impact that's having on families. Whatever job you have is lost. All because you couldn't pay bail, right? The congressman mentioned that the system should be based, not wealth-based, but risk-based, okay? Discrimination and pretrial options. You're going to have some communities where individuals may um, be assigned to maybe check in with your local um, office during pretrial, where you're going to have some communities, quite honestly, communities of color, that are probably going to be more likely to be detained or they're going to be more likely to be assigned GPS monitoring, which many times is attached to a private monitoring agency. So the fees that accrue with that, and then if you can't pay the GPS monitoring fees, then you're then detained. So it's like your GPS monitoring fees become your bail. Okay? Criminal justice fines and fees, traffic fines, and then when you're not able to pay those fines, the fees that come from your inability to pay those fines, and then that leads you back into the system because you're poor. Now you think you're out of the system, you have this criminal record that's now the collateral consequence of your incarceration. It is now impacting your ability to get a job, housing, higher education, public assistance, and a whole host of other issues and, and initiatives that could very well ensure that someone is able to remain in a life that is crime free and that they are economically mobile and stable. This is the criminalization of poverty. No program can fix this, laws. Folks like you are the only ones who are gonna be able to fix this, both in the courthouse and in the state house. And many times when, whether it's a child support modification, Judges will say things like, oh, well, you know, you have something on the side, or because um, you have someone who, that you're living with, and this, you're maybe couch surfing, right, but you're living with them, and they are economically mobile, so you're going to be able to pay something, and this is what you're going to be forced to pay. But it's up to many times our legal professionals and advocates to really educate our judicial officers on what folks are going through and this intersectionality of race, incarceration, and employment. When it comes to the state house, passing laws that seek to uh, decriminalize poverty, whether it's eliminating body attachment for um, owing civil debt, whether it's ensuring that for any and everything that has to do with fines and fees or the criminal justice system, you're taking into account someone's ability to pay before you set some financial obligation that they're going to be required to meet. And if they don't meet it, then they are incarcerated. Expanding access to expungement so that you're reducing the impact of the criminal record on someone's ability to be successful. And then, of course, investing in robust pretrial services. This includes educational assistance and substance abuse and job training. All of these things so that while someone is waiting pending trial, then maybe they are being aligned with resources that could very well look good when trial comes. But also, these are probably resources they should have been connected with before they got into the pretrial system. And maybe it would not have led them into the pretrial system. So I think my time is up. If you did not get anything from my presentation, please know that almost in every state, there are laws and policies on the books that are effectively criminalizing poor folks, and particularly poor black and brown folks. And these are laws and policies that pretty much state if you cannot meet the financial obligations of a law, then we are going to criminalize and penalize you, and that is the solution. And in communities like Baltimore City and many other communities around the state, we are finding that these are communities that are over-policed and underserved, 
We continue to invest in police. We continue to invest in our correctional systems. And yet, we don't fund things like legal aid and public defenders and legal services. We don't fund things like job training and educational assistance and all of these things. And that is why we have this issue of the intersection of race, incarceration, and employment. Thank you. Well, I think we've all been taught a lesson about the consequences, collateral consequences of incarceration. And I really appreciate that presentation. Uh, State's Attorney Aisha Brayboy has joined us. We are very happy to have her. She is the State's Attorney for Prince George's County, Maryland. She is the daughter of an immigrant from Granada and is an accomplished lawyer with nearly two decades of legal and legislative experience. Prior to being elected as State's Attorney for Prince George's County with 98.7% of the vote in November 2018, she served as the Manager of Government Affairs for Children's National Health System. She is also of counsel with Gabriel J. Christian and Associates at one point, where she represented clients in criminal and civil matters. In addition, Aisha, for over 17 years, served as General Counsel for the Community Public Awareness Council, a community-based juvenile divisioner divisionary program that has successfully diverted over 4,000 students from the criminal justice system, and that is a powerful statement in and of itself. In 2006, Bray Boy was elected to represent the 25th Legislative District in the Maryland General Assembly, and as a delegate, Aisha was appointed by the Speaker of the House to serve as Chair of the Consumer Protection Subcommittee. She was elected by her peers to serve as Chair of the Legislative Black Caucus of Maryland, where she guides a 44-member organization on a wide range of policy issues, including parity for historically black colleges and universities, reducing mass incarceration, enhancing tools to promote to prosecute rapists, increasing opportunities for women and minority-owned businesses, and reducing health disparities in our state. I think that we are very proud in Prince George's County to have State's Attorney Brave boy, because I am a Prince George's County uh, a resident, and I am very, very proud to have had her accept our invitation to present to us today on this very important topic. Just that just. 
Um, and oftentimes that means providing people uh, with an opportunity to have a second chance. And so I can tell you a few things that my office has done already uh, to sort of change the way in which we interface with the criminal justice system. Um, recently, um, I dropped an appeal of a, in a case, of a case dealing with um, an individual who was sentenced while they were a juvenile uh, to life uh, in prison. The sentence was then reduced to, I think, about 58 years. Um, and the state, under the previous administration, um, appealed the decision of the uh, circuit court judge uh, that um, reduced the sentence. And that case was headed uh, to, uh, for a hearing, I think, in a, in a couple months or so. Um, when we reviewed the facts of the case, um, I determined uh, that this individual that, who, was, who was charged, convicted, and sentenced as a juvenile, who's now an adult, um, had rehabilitated himself, had availed himself of all of the opportunities while he was in jail, that he was a model uh, inmate in jail. And I made the decision last week to drop that appeal of the sentence. And that's not an easy thing to do, because there's critics on every side. Um, but when you're in this position, you have that power. And you have to make the tough decision. I didn't take this job because I thought it would be easy. I knew that there would be decisions that were unpopular. Um, but when you're in a position like state's attorney, it's not about popularity. It's about what's fair and what's just. Um, so that so so I created um, a function in my office that reviews both sentencing integrity and uh, conviction integrity because I thought it was important uh, that we have a mechanism in our office to review cases um, where individuals believe that they were um, improperly convicted and also cases where individuals believe that they received unfair sentences and again it's tough because these are sentences that your office got years and years ago, oftentimes. And so you're sort of reviewing the work of maybe some people who are actually in the office with you. But that is what justice requires, and that is what our office is doing. In addition to that, having worked, um, as was mentioned, um, in healthcare for almost three years, I recognize the impact of health disparities, and especially mental health disparities, on our criminal justice system. Um, I worked for Children's National Health System and I led our policy efforts. And one thing that I can tell you, um, because I have worked around a lot of research scientists um, and doctors, is that there is um, a difference in how a brain develops when it has been traumatized. The science shows that. We can actually go into the brain and take pictures of a brain that is normal and a brain that has been impacted by trauma. And so the impulse control, um, the frontal lobe, as some people say, you know, we you know, used to talk about, that's real. There is a difference in how individuals respond to different stimulus based on their experience. And so understanding that, um, I changed around my juvenile unit. My juvenile unit was purely a prosecutorial unit. And I said, we need to have a real youth justice unit, not simply focused on prosecution, but in addition to prosecution for those very serious offenses, we need to focus on intervention and prevention and diversion. And so that unit now, not just, that unit doesn't just have prosecutors in it now, uh, we also have um, individuals who uh, provide services to us for intervention, goes out to our high schools talks to, and talks to our students. We also have interaction with our youth services bureaus um, that are in our various municipalities throughout the county and other community-based nonprofits that work with young people um, to provide them the resources they need in order to make better decisions. It is extremely important to me that we not institutionalize our young people unnecessarily. And so one of the strategies that we're working on now is a strategy to work with our police uh, departments throughout the county um, to, to use a, what we call a pre-charge diversion option, which is before the J-1s are written for our young people. 
that those charges, and, and, and submit it to the Department of Juvenile Services, that those charges come to the state's attorney's office, or those pre-charges come to the state's attorney's office. And then we will determine whether or not we believe there's an appropriate um, out of sort of process remedy for that young person. And oftentimes there is. We don't want to institutionalize our young people. We don't want to create records and systems for our young people. Uh, we want to provide them with the best option to make better decisions in the future. Excuse me, in the future. And we believe that means um, preventing them from going further into a system that is not actually designed to rehabilitate them or doesn't have the resources to rehabilitate them. Um, but we are very in touch with the community-based resources in our county, and we have a vested interest in making sure that they have the best outcomes. And so as state's attorney, my job also is to ensure that our young people have the ability to be connected to those uh, programs that will provide, that, that is in their best interest. And that is, the, the uh, goal of, of the juvenile system is to provide what is in the best interest of that child. And so I feel as state's attorney, I have a role, in play, role to play in that. And so we are uh, working on developing uh, a program within our office. We look forward in the fall to hiring a full-time uh, medical director that will assist us in the appropriate placement of young people who come through our office. That's groundbreaking stuff, but it's reality because so many people, both adults and children, who are in the uh, criminal justice system have undiagnosed mental health issues. They have uh, undiagnosed um, substance abuse issues. And if we continue to institutionalize them, they are going to continue to be traumatized and those issues are going to be exacerbated. And so my job is to keep my community safe. And in order to do that, I can't just do what's popular or what's easy. Sometimes we have to do the hard work, and we're, we're doing that. In addition, when it comes to adult offenders, we want to take the same approach, especially to um, which the majority of our uh, crimes occur in the, like, dis our district court level offenses, uh, which means we really don't have, we have victims, but maybe they're not extremely violent, uh, uh, victims of extremely violent crimes. Uh, but the, these are district court level offenses where we think if we provide the appropriate intervention at that level, they won't go further into the system. Because what we've done is we've looked back at some of our cases and, and the individuals who are defendants in cases, and we can see that they have sort of graduated from uh, juvenile court to district court and then to circuit court. So if we don't catch them at the, um, the juvenile court level, and we catch them at the district court level, we have an opportunity to meaningfully intervene there. And I've talked to our um, public defender uh, in Prince George's County, and we plan to partner uh, to develop uh, uh, appropriate um, diversion opportunities for individuals who are in the system or who have entered the system. We don't want them to stay in the system. We want them to get the help that they need to make better decisions in life. But I have to understand my role in that as well. It's not just the numbers. I can't just say, well, I've got an X number of convictions, and so we're good. I have to look at um, what, what will keep our community safe. What are those appropriate interventions in our system that we can develop in our system to help people make better decisions in the future? And in order to do that, I have to work with all the players in the criminal justice system, the public defenders, the private bar, the, um, the, the, the judges, and we're pulling all of those people together so that we can develop the best, uh, the best programs for people who offend in our communities. We cannot incarcerate ourselves into a safer community. It just doesn't happen. Because the problem is, by, if I lock you up today and you don't get the help you need in the future, nine times out of ten you're coming back out, committing very similar offenses or more serious offenses, and then I have to go through the whole process of trying to get you locked up again. But if I can meaningfully intervene in your life early in the process, 
to get you the help that you need so that you can make better decisions, then we are in a much better place as a society. Now, this may be a little different um, attitude, I guess, than some uh, historically uh, state attorneys have had. But that's because they measure their success by the number of convictions that they were able to get. But if you measure your success by um, the, 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 the idea that if, if that person doesn't become a repeat offender, then, then that's successful. If I measure my success by, you know, communities who have seen a reduction in crime over time because we have implemented smart programs in those communities, even with those people who have offended in those communities and those communities feel safer, to me that is a true measurement of whether or not we've been successful in reducing crime in our communities and having smart and strategic ways of addressing uh, criminal activity in our communities. We know that over-incarceration just doesn't work. Now, don't get me wrong. We do prosecute people every single day. And some people, we just have to. They've committed very serious offenses, whether it's murder, rape, armed robbery, if they have uh, swindled people out of money. I mean, we, we, there are people that we are definitely going to prosecute and we are going to seek appropriate sentences for. But when we look at the number of what we consider minor offenders in our community, that's the majority of people going through our system. And so we can really meaningfully intervene, take away the stigma of having a record from these individuals. That's what's going to keep our community safe. Because if they don't have a record, then they are not going to get discriminated against because of their record when they're looking for a job they're looking for housing, or if they want to get a uh, scholarship to pursue education. I and mean, that, to me, is what keeps our community safer, and that's the smart approach. Um, I recently met with one of, one of the biggest labor unions in our area, and I talked to them about the idea of having pre-charge diversion options that their unions would support, meaning we could send individuals who had been charged by the police or have been arrested by the police. Um, but before either the police charge them or we charge them, we can give them the option of going into a training program so that they can develop skills so that they can take care of themselves and their families. They are so on board. And we, we have meetings set up with several other unions in our area. Because what the unions have told me is that they really don't care about a person's record. What they care about is whether that person um, wants to be gainfully employed, whether, whether or not they want uh, to learn a skill, and if they want to be proficient at the skill. And if they do, they will train them, and they will give them an opportunity to earn a good wage and have good benefits. And that's what most people want. They just want to be able to make it. And so as state's attorney, Again, my job is to keep my community safe. And I'm willing to look at alternatives other than prosecution to do that. Because, because we know <coughs> over-prosecution over and over-incarceration -incar has not kept our community safer. In fact, they have made it more unsafe. And then we deal with all of the other consequences of having people who have been over-incarcerated in our communities. So I look forward to more of this discussion, um, but I thank you so much for having me here. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think uh, this, uh, our next presenter is going to give a natural uh, uh, flow to this conversation. Uh, Abdallah Latif uh, is uh, uh, a gentleman who was sentenced to life as a juvenile. And so I think that that is going to give a significant perspective on what the system brings uh, as we start to talk about life sentences, but especially that uh, of a juvenile. Uh, he is the Pennsylvania Coordinator for the Incarcerated Children's Advocacy Network and Outreach Initiative of the Campaign for the Fair Sentencing of Youth. 
After conducting several months of exploratory contract work for the campaign, Abdallah officially joined the campaign for the Fair Sentencing Youth Team in January of 2019. In his capacity as Pennsylvania Coordinator for the Incarcerated Children's Advocacy Network, Abdallah serves as the team's liaison. In spite of being condemned to juvenile life without parole, also known as death by incarceration, and without hope or expectation of ever being released, Abdallah managed to transform himself into just one remarkable individual with lessons to teach us all, I believe. While incarcerated, he studied legal jurisprudence, and he ultimately matured into a leader that engendered respect from both inmates and prison administrators alike. While petitioning to overturn his life without parole sentence, Abdallah engaged himself in numerous learning, leadership, and mentoring roles within the prison. Since his release, Abdallah has continued his youth advocacy and sentencing reform efforts. Today, along with being the Pennsylvania ICANN coordinator for the campaign for the Fair Sentencing of Youth, Abdallah is also the chairman, pro tempore of Life After Death Incorporated, a member of the Pennsylvania, of the Philadelphia, I'm sorry, Reentry Coalition, a member of the University of Pennsylvania's Gold Ring Reentry Initiatives Advisory Board, and a Philadelphia Reentry Think Tank Fellow. So I wish that, um, that we will all welcome Abdallah and have him present to us on his perspective of the incarceration and the criminal justice system as we have it. Mm -hmm.
particularly African American women, who at that time were domestic servants, and disproportionately was falsely accused of black or larceny and incarcerated. And so if we look at the long trajectory of incarceration, it didn't start with Nixon's war on drugs or war on poverty. It started way before that. And while we're living presently, contemporaneously, in a moment of promise, in a moment of enlightenment, if we don't ground our reality, the reality of this moment, with the long history of subjugation, of racism and depravity, depravity that took place in this country, we will not come to fix what we're beginning to recognize as a massive problem. And so to contextualize, although we are in this promising place, in this promising time, what is it that we have yet to grapple with? My presentation will be a bit different. I will begin by asking a question or two. I need participation from the audience. Many of you are lawyers, so I'm sure you have wonderful answers. So who would be the first show of hands by a show of hands to explain to us or give us a definition of justice? Anyone by a show of hands, don't be shy. I can volunteer if that's necessary. Angela? <laughs> um, I would say that justice uh, is the result of demonstrated fairness. Um, and so regardless of what you're talking about, as long as it's something that's implemented fairly, you know, that's a start. Um, okay. There's no wrong answers. Yes. And your name, please, if you don't mind. I'm Anne Green Greco. Good afternoon. And good afternoon. Pleasure to be here. here. Um, I, but just very simply, I see justice as trying to achieve uh, the best, fairest outcomes for everybody being treated equally. Mm. Excellent. Excellent. Can we take one more? Come on, you look like you. Come on, yeah. Yes, your name? Third row, yes. Uh, Anthony. Anthony. Uh, justice, I think, is uh, an everlasting battle between um, temporary positions um, that doesn't just stop at a decision or, or uh, a legislative law. Um, it's, it's, a, it's an overarching uh, battle that, of, of objectiveness. Mm -hmm. As I said, there's no right or wrong answer. It's interesting and melody. I was going to say equity. Oh, okay, equity. I like that, but that wasn't the question. I'm going to oh. switch the question oh. <laughs> <laughs> So, values. How would you define values? Something that you believe in and demonstrate in your actions. Something that you believe in and demonstrate in your actions. Our actions. Value. Miss Michelle, is that? Set of beliefs. Very well. As I said, there's no right or wrong answer, but there is importance for us individually and collectively as a society to grapple what, what we believe justice is, what we believe values are. Because why we talk about policy as Congressman Congress pointed out, or excuse me, Bobby Scott and your colleague Congress, uh, pointed out, 
in terms of policy, right? It can be counterintuitive. It can be boneheaded. Sometimes we can get it right, sometimes we can get it wrong. But policy isn't the central issue. The central, the core issue is one of our perceptions of justice and values. So if values doesn't inform our concept of justice, then we get what we now realize as mass incarceration. Why is it that, that people of color, African Americans in particular, are disproportionately overrepresented in the criminal justice system? It's not just because of policy. There's something that, there's a predicate, and it's the lack of value that attached to African American folks that didn't start yesterday. It started a millennia ago, and we're still grappling with the consequences of that as we speak. So at 17 years of age, I was an unwitting accomplice to an adult and what was intended to be a snatch and run unarmed robbery. There was no intent to cause harm, let alone cause someone's death. An individual was grabbed from behind. I rifled through the man's pockets. He was pushed to the ground and received a fractured finger. He was an elderly, elderly gentleman. He went to the hospital immediately after the event, was given an ice pack and Tylenol and released. He returned to the hospital a day later, complaining of pain in the head. A tomography or bone scan was conducted, and it was determined that he had a fracture or a borderline fracture of the femur. An operation was performed to correct an alleged borderline fracture of the femur. Complications ensued. Eighteen days later, the individual died of a heart attack, was unable to be resuscitated. My co-defendant implicated myself. We both were charged with first, second, third degree murder, voluntary, involuntary manslaughter, robbery, burglary, criminal trespass, and criminal conspiracy. Ultimately, I was sentenced to life without possibility of parole. I served 31 years before being released in the fall of 2017 due to the United States Supreme Court decision. It wasn't policy alone that created that outcome. It was a lack of value for people like myself. I was the first individual in Montgomery County, Pennsylvania to be charged as an adult the very first one to receive a life without possibility of parole sentence. I wasn't the first individual to be involved in a homicide. Wasn't the first child, unfortunately, to be involved in a homicide. But I was the first one to meet that consequence, that outcome. And so while we're having this discussion, this is not at all to suggest that people aren't able to change. It's not to suggest that people who have more egregious uh, fact, casual facts than myself, that they are less deserving. It's just necessary for us to point out and grapple with the fact that the ratio is one to 10 in terms of disparity between African Americans children who have been sentenced to life without parole. Why is that disparity as such? Because we can look at white children who commit the same harm and see value in that individual. 
and therefore we are willing to extend mercy, second chances, opportunity. But when we look at a black child with the very same circumstances, we see a predator, a super predator, a murderer, a monster, someone who is recalcitrant, remorseless, a threat to society, in perpetuity, never able capable of changing. So that reflects our values and our sense of what justice is. So I won't be labor the point that I've already gone past my time. But I think it's important that while we talk about those big issues, those policy issues, those numbers issues, that we also look at something more fundamental and that we look at our values and how we see individuals who have caused harm. Realizing that it is often the case, particularly in the African American community, that those who have caused harm were themselves subjected to harm. And when that harm goes untreated, it often manifests in harming others. But just as harm people often harm others, it's also true that heal people help heal others. And so we have people both inside as well as outside who have committed a tremendous amount of harm, but are also doing a tremendous amount of good and healing in our communities, both inside as well as outside. And we need to celebrate and appreciate that. We need to give value to that. We need to see individuals' humanity because we are not the sum total of the worst thing that we have uh, ever done. When Brian Stevenson talks about just mercy and proximity, proximity gives you an understanding and a context so that you don't just see my skin color, that you don't just see the crime that I was engaged in, but you see the wholeness and the fullness of my human being, of my potential of in being contrite, making amends, that is part of the story as well. And we need to acknowledge that, not just for my sake, but collectively for our sake as human beings, as it is one of the ways that are rudimented in reducing harm within our communities, is to understand the forces of harm. If I can take just two more minutes, when we talk about harm, the core drivers of harm are centered in shame, isolation, being subjected or exposed to violence, and the, in the inability to meet one's economic needs. On a personal level, not at institutional level, but at personal level. These are the core drivers of violence. And so when we look at our response to those who commit violence, we shame them, we isolate them, we subject them to more violence in a place where they're being exploited and unable to meet their basic survival needs. This place is called prison. Prison does the exact thing, it has the exact components that are the very drivers of violence to begin with. And so as we rethink our values, we rethink what we think justice is, we should also rethink our response in a way that is more restorative and does it exactly the harm that is done in our communities. I thank you very much and I look forward to our discussion. I think our panel has really performed very well. They've provided great uh, information and insights for us. And thank you for putting up with my voice 
and everything this afternoon. I had a nut allergy and I didn't realize that there were nuts on salad. And so between the EpiPen and the nut, I really had a problem keeping the, keeping the boys and the, the, uh, everything moving quite right. But I thank you for your tolerance of that and I hope that we have uh, further discussion with these panelists, questions, inquiries that you would like to make as we start to uh, uh, dig, dig deeper into the consequences of incarceration. Yes, President Thomas. I have a question for you. Um, good to see you also. Um, on the previous, earlier this afternoon, your colleague Richard um, Lipstick was here. And um, I'm wondering if the two of you work with your colleagues around the state to put together um, policies and proposals at the state level to deal with reform issues. In my state of Illinois, we have um, maybe one or two progressive prosecutors, but we have counties in our state that are quite conservative, where the county prosecutor is not necessarily interested in the issue that we're talking about today. Do you have that same challenge in Maryland? And so how do you, on the state level, work collectively with the county in particular to, to make proposals? That's a fascinating question. <laughs> <laughs> and in fact, we experienced it this year. Um, so we have something called the Maryland State's Attorneys Association. And the 24 jurisdictions in Maryland each have a state's attorney. Um, and that includes the um, city of Baltimore and the others are counties. Um, and while Maryland itself, um, the majority of people in our larger population areas like Prince George's County, Montgomery County, and Baltimore City, of which um, people might describe as being quote unquote more progressive areas. Um, the majority of our counties are, um, I would say, more conservative. And the state's attorneys in those areas, whether they're, whether they're Democrats or Republicans, um, oftentimes um, take a more conservative stance on issues. So either they take zero stance or no stance at all, or they um, tend to be a little bit more conservative. Now, I'll give you an example. Um, this year, we had a bill uh, that actually simply gave uh, state attorneys the discretion uh, to uh, move to vacate um, uh, convictions if we believe that justice required it to do so. Um, and myself and um, Baltimore state attorney Marilyn Mosby were the only state attorneys to um, uh, speak out and testify in favor of the legislation. Um, the majority of our colleagues opposed the legislation. It was quite interesting because the reality was they were opposed to giving more discretion to themselves, which, you know, usually people like more discretion, but right. that's what we thought. Uh, but, but, you know, I, I have to respect their decisions and, and, and what they believe is in the interest of their communities. Um, and so, um, so we kind of, the two of us stood alone in terms of our uh, support for that legislation. Um, and I would say that there's, there's other legislation that we will probably uh, fall in one you know, uh, you know, side of versus the others. We do try to come together around legislation uh, that you know, obviously I think has, you know, are, it's kind of like neutral in terms of being quote unquote progressive or not that deals with issues around like uh, sexual assault legislation and things like that, that I think we can all come together. So, so there, there's legislation that we can all work on um, when it comes to things that may seem to, uh, something like call more progressive. Um, we find a lot of resistance um, within the Maryland State Attorney Association in moving in that direction. And that may be guided by the people who they represent and what they believe um, their constituents, um, you know, what, what position they think their constituents might have on a piece of legislation, or inherently what they think that the state's attorney's role should be, which is maybe to protect convictions as opposed to questioning convictions. Um, and so um, there, there is um, there's a, there's certainly a, a break in terms of um, how we might look at certain pieces of legislation. And if I believe something is important, I'm going to go for it, regardless of whether the association agrees with my position or not. One last follow-up. So are you, Richard, and Ron, the only three African-American prosecutors 
Okay. No, okay. no, we, no. Um, also, uh, Tony Covington, who is the Charles County State's Attorney, is the other African American State's Attorney. There's four out of 24. There's four out of 24, and there are three women out of 24 as well. This, this could go to several of you. Uh, it has to do with the role of money in and the value. And I've seen it come up in two contexts in New York, which I will note parenthetically has just passed what has been called the criminal justice reform bill. It does deal with things like um, bail and some other things that are arrested. But in two different contexts in which I was involved in the state bar, uh, one of which had to do with diversion programs that DAs would be involved in, where the DAs Association took the view, well, this is very nice if you're from a wealthy uh, county that gets a lot of criminal forfeitures and other work or other money coming into it from your prosecutions. But us poor counties, we love to do these programs, but if the state doesn't give us more money, then we can't afford to do it. Uh, so we then proposed the state for it. And then this year, I'm on a school decision pipeline committee in which school districts said, well, they'd love to not have to suspend people and throw the book at them and do, have other programs that would help ameliorate things so they didn't wind up in juvenile facilities. But again, they said, but the state has to give us more money and we can't afford to do this, so we have to be draconian. So the point in both contexts that the people were objecting was not that they disagreed with what we were saying, but that the state can't just say that this is a nice thing. They have to deal with inequities financially among the counties. This could be something that's coming up in Congress, I suppose, between different states. But I just thought I should throw that out on the table as uh, the last speaker spoke about values. Some of these people seem to be very nervous about the value of money that they may not have, even though they recognize, at least they claim to recognize, the value of doing some of these things. I'm, I'm actually going to, I'm going to make a comment. Um, I'm not answering your question. I'm going to leave it up to the other panelists who may be more, um, provide more compelling answers. But um, a comment that, um, a, a piece of your question around um, how can we ensure that we're providing resources for youth that are um, getting in trouble in school and ensuring that we are dismantling the school to prison pipeline. What I want to say to that. Um, is to elevate something that we recently did in Maryland and I would urge other states um, to do this and to look into it is we find that the whole school to prison pipeline um, many times is also racialized. So if, if you remember State's Attorney Brayboy um, highlighted the fact that there is actual science to show that trauma will influence behavior, right? And so what we found in Maryland, we actually had to pass a law around this is that we found that young black boys and girls were more likely to be suspended and expelled as a result of basic behavior issues that you could find with other children and other youths of other races and ethnicities. And that in and of itself, when you're expelling someone, when you're suspending them, when you're always responding with very punitive um, responses to something that really should um, have the response of a dedicated, educated, qualified health and human service practitioner, um, then that is your funnel into the prison pipeline. For you, and so that's not a question, but I, I wanted to flag that for folks in the room that when you talk about how to dismantle it, one of the ways to dismantle it is really look at how we are penalizing our youth of color, um, even in kindergarten, for just basic behavioral challenges that then lead to these um, in, in unjust responses. You mentioned the school, school to prison pipeline. There are a lot of things that go on in schools that promote that pipeline. Uh, unnecessary suspensions, one of them to get suspended a couple of times, likely if you ever graduating, go down, and dropouts are very highly correlated with future future crimes because that's just the trajectory you're on. And what gets you suspended? There's a, as in California, there's a crime or a suspension uh, behavior called direct defiance. Um, you know, 
uh, and you get kicked out of school for that and put in the school and prison uh, pipeline. There, there are a lot of things that we need to do to make sure that uh, we promote education and not just resort to uh, um, uh, just suspensions. There's, part of it is the strategy used in, in schools, whether you're using uh, punishment or positive reinforcement, is a positive PBIS, positive behavior interventions and supports a proactive uh, prevention and early intervention strategy rather than wait until you have an argument and kick them out of school, which has been shown to significantly reduce suspensions and reduce the, uh, the uh, school to prison pipeline. Um, Trauma, uh, you've seen in Parkland and in Newtown recently, uh, suicides involved, and obviously um, psychological mental health services are desperately needed to address the trauma uh, created by, uh, by those tragedies. Uh, you have to, as you do that, you ought not ignore the fact that in Chicago that kind of trauma is a daily occurrence, and so whatever support they need in Parkland, they've needed for a long time in Chicago, so let's help everybody. Um, and you, you mentioned uh, money and, um, in, in the policy making, civil, civil, civil asset forfeiture, which was discussed in the last panel, uh, gives the local, and distorts the local policing to areas where you can pick up some money and help fund your next bonus and your raises and you're funding the police department based on where the money is. And the civil action forfeiture is just a, 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 an abusive idea where you take somebody's money and make them prove their innocence and get the money back. Um, you uh, have private prisons where the... Uh, uh, one thing I haven't seen outside of California, maybe Michigan and Ohio, is the private prisons actually lobbying for abusive uh, Respect and abuse of policy. They just kind of sit back and let politicians be themselves. Um, but in some areas, that can be a uh, uh, conflict of interest and get you into uh, uh, policies that don't make sense. But uh, a lot of this policy, uh, in kind of the last question, involves politics. Constituents ought not allow politicians to come up with simple minded foolishness that locks people up unnecessarily, gets them, uh, gets their kids uh, kicked out of school unnecessarily and into a, prison, a school or prison pipeline. We need to use the political system. Uh, we saw this in Ferguson, Missouri, after Michael Brown was, um, uh, was shot. Um, within, um, within a year or so, um, the um, council, the blacks, it was majority black area, they had one, I think, one out of seven council members was black. Uh, within a year, I think it was a majority black council, police chief was gone, the mayor was gone, and I think they needed an election or two and the prosecutor was gone. Uh, and I think that's what you have to do if you want to make good policy, you can't let these elections pass by and um, not be heard. And I would just like to just identify a barrier violence that we should address. Um, there's a and so you're right, a lot of these diversion uh, programs that have those aren't necessarily funded, but you can look at uh, opportunities to take advantage of resources that are already there. For instance, if I know that a large portion of the young people who um, come into contact with the criminal justice system have a um, mental health issue or a substance abuse issue, what I also know is that um, they are either on private insurance or they're on Medicaid and they have the ability to seek and we can direct them to the appropriate services that the government or their private insurer will pay for for their mental health or substance abuse treatment. In addition to that, um, I've reached out to one of our local universities, Bowie State University, and they have agreed to assist us with um, connecting our young people with social workers or social work students who can assist them and really follow up with them as part of their program and their graduation requirements, they're now going to be working with our young people who 
we don't say going through the system because we're hoping to birth them out of the system, but they will assist them in provide, getting the resources that they and their families need in order for them to be stronger. We've also reached out to my alma mater, Howard University, so that their um, juvenile um, justice clinic will um, work with, with us. And in addition to that, even our uh, unions, as I mentioned before, of course, they work with our adult uh, individuals who are adults, but also with young people as well. Because if we put our young people on a path to success, if we can get them involved in learning a skill or a trade, they are less likely to offend because they know that they have a future somewhere. And they can still go on to get their two or four year degree. That doesn't prevent them from doing it, but it gives them a direction and structure. Because what we understand is that so many of our young people live in households where there is not structure and they need it. And so while we don't have a whole lot of money to implement all the diversion programs we'd like to implement, but we do know that there are resources out in our community and if we just believe it is our responsibility uh, to solve these problems and figure out what's out there, uh, we can connect and develop these programs for our young people without adding additional money that we may or may not First, I just want to thank you all for being here today and sharing your incredibly powerful views and ideas about what can be done in this area. And more than that, for as, as Mr. Lateef referred to, you know, well, you're dealing with 400 years of unrelenting, entrenched repression, oppression, and subjugation that you have to overcome. And where you begin, and each of you are beginning somewhere and doing what you can in a way that makes a difference. And that, that is so incredibly invaluable. Uh, it just it brings tears to my eyes being here. So I'm, I'm so grateful to you for that. My related point is, I wanted to ask Ms. Brayboy and all of you, um, there's a program in Los Angeles County uh, that's a, a, a diversion program that begins at the point of arrest. So that at the point of arrest, the diversion starts. The arrest never goes on the record. And that program starts in the County Department of Public Health. I'm actually very intimately familiar with it because my daughter actually created the program. But it, it starts before they even get anywhere near having a record. And, and the Department of Public Health has gotten dropped the funding in and managed to create a dialogue with the, the police department, and the DA, and the probation, and everybody involved. And there's a lot of people fighting back against it, but they managed to create that community cooperation that gets those kids out of the system. Is that something that's happening with you? So, yes, yeah, so that's exactly the model that um, we're implementing. Um, so, the charge is right now um, when the, the police arrest an individual, uh, a juvenile, that their charges goes to what's called the Department of Ju Juvenile Services, which is a state agency. That agency right now makes the decision on whether or not there is the appropriate uh, diversion option in the community or whether or not. Um, that case should be forwarded to the state attorney's office for prosecution. Once the state attorney's office receives a case from, from DJS, we can either dismiss the charge or prosecute. We don't have the ability after it's referred from DJS to divert. And so um, what I, one of the first um, you know, things I did was I connected my juvenile, what we call it now youth justice unit, because you know, quite frankly, when we say juvenile justice, you think of individuals who are, have problems. <coughs> and, I, and I find that to individuals who have challenges that we just need to overcome, they are still our children. And so, um, so, so anyway, so we connected with the police department on one of our first meetings. Um, and, and, I, and I personally called the police chief and said, hey, I, my, my uh, 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 unit chief is going to be meeting with your <coughs> folks. And I really want you all to keep an open mind about uh, helping us to divert these cases before they go to juvenile services. And they were very receptive to it. And so right now we're developing uh, that that model. And I'm happy to know there's one out there that we can look to. Um, so I look forward to hearing your information. But, um, but, but we are doing that because you're absolutely right. We don't want them in their minds to think that they are institutionalized, that they're going <coughs> further into a system, that they are documented in any system. We want to do our best to keep them out of a system. And it is the localities to me, not the state, that is in the best interest, uh, that's in the best position to do that. Because I know what the resources are in my jurisdiction. I'm connected to, 
had, I was the general counsel for juvenile diversion program for 15 years, so I know the over 4,000 people who we helped and how great this program is for those young people. And I know those young people are coming back to mentor the young people come, going through the program now. So I feel as the elected prosecutor, that is part of my job. And so that is the exact model that we think is helpful. And in addition to young people who have um, committed offenses, I believe that so many of our adults who have committed offenses <coughs> also benefit from a similar system. Because if, if we divert them before they're even charged, because one of the things that I'm going to say is that some folks say, well, we're not going to, prosecutors say, well, I'm not going to prosecute for certain offenses. But that doesn't mean that person won't have a record because they are charged by the police. That information, information is in whatever the state system is with those charges. Even if I no pass or set those charges, the reality is they still have a record at least for a period of time, whether it's a year, two years, three years, that will still have collateral consequences for them. But if I can convince, and, and we're working on it, convince the police department to join us in an effort to prevent people from going in the system, giving them an opportunity before they are documented, uh, then I think we would have better outcomes. Arrests that do not have a conviction. We're exactly. having, we're having trouble. Even, even, even. And the idea that you have a collateral consequence now in police follow up, the fact you've been arrested a couple of times, you know, the police can use that. They're about the only ones that have any justification on doing that. Um, the, um, and we've been having trouble on background checks. 